This demonstration will go over all the required knowledge and Mathematica functions in order to create Table 10.2.6, the glycolysis stoichiometric matrix. First, we're going to go over pure functions in Mathematica. So if we want to create a function, say the square function, there are three ways to do this. Either we can say square of an input equals the input squared. So now when we run this, we can see that it squares the input. It squares 3 and gives us 9. Another way we can do this is to say square equals a function. So the function function in Mathematica represents a, something called a pure function. So we can say it's a function that takes whatever the parameter, which is pound, and then squares it. So now we're going to call this square 2, just so that we know that there's a difference. So now when we take square 2 of 3, it also gives us 9. So now the third way we can do this is to take out this actual bulky word function and just replace it with the and sign afterwards, which represents that everything before it is part of the function. So if we run this, and we say square 3 of 4, we get 16. Now this reduced notation is very useful for parts of Mathematica that are called functional programming. For example, the function map benefits greatly from the use of this shorthand function notation. So map kind of acts like a for loop. What it does is it applies the function to each element in expression. So say that we wanted to square every element in a list. We could map the function square across 1, 2, 3, 4, and that squares every element in the list. We can also use some of these other versions of the function. So we could put a function in here, an actual pure function, and it'll do the same. And we can even use this shorthand notation, and it will do the same. Now, to make it even shorter than this, we can take this function and use the slash at symbol instead of map. And that signifies that we have a function that squares the input, and then we map that across this list. Using functional programming like this, can result in very short, concise code to do very complicated things. For example, if we take the stoichiometric matrix of glycolysis, say that we want to define the participation number of each of the metabolites. The participation number is defined as all the non-zero elements of each row. It's the number of reactions that each metabolite participates in. So, if we look at this function, count takes a list and it counts the number of elements that matches the pattern. So if we want to count the number of non-zero elements in a list, we would want to count all elements except for the number zero. And so that gives us two as we see here. So if we wanted to do this for one row of the glycolytic stoichiometric matrix, we could count all the non-zero elements in a single row, and it would give us two. Now say that we want to do this, but for each row. So we're going to make this a new function. By putting in the placeholder here, the parameter, and then designating as a function with the and sign, now this function, when applied to anything, will count the number of non-zero elements in each, or in that list. So say that we once again want to apply it to this list here. It works just the same way as a regular function where it has the input inside the square brackets. Now we can also map this function. So if we write map, and we want to map this function across the entire stoichiometric matrix. And what that'll do is it'll count the number of non-zero elements in each row, because it applies this function to each row. 
and this is the participation number of all of them. And now to make this a little shorter, this is what you'd see in the actual textbook. Now we can do the same thing to look at the connectivity. So if we transpose the glycolytic, the stoichiometric matrix, now all of the columns are rows. So now it's very easy to count the number of non-zero elements in each column, which is now each row. So we can do the exact same thing that we did up here. Count the number of non-zero elements. And we designate it as a function, and we mapped it across this transposed glycolytic matrix. And this gives the participation number of each of the reactions, or sorry, the connectivity of each of the reactions. This will be used to generate the row here for pi, and this up here will be used to generate this column for rho. The next thing I'm going to go over is the two functions, table form and grid. So before, when I printed out the glycolytic matrix, it looked kind of ugly. To fix this, we can use the table form function. So now it's arranged in a table, but it's still very spread out. So we're going to say table spacing goes to 1, 1, and table alignments goes to the right. That way it's all aligned to the right. Now this looks a lot better, but this table needs to have headings on each the, on the row and the columns. So we're going to use the table heading options. First we do the heading for the rows, which is the name of the species. And then the heading for the columns, which is the fluxes. Now these fluxes can be a little long, so we're going to rotate them. So if we look back up here at the list of fluxes, we want to rotate these using the function rotate. So you just give the item that you want to rotate and the angle that you want to rotate it to. So if we say rotate the fluxes, by pi over 2 or 90 degrees, it'll rotate the entire list, which is not what we want. Instead, we want to rotate each individual element in the list. So to do that, we use our friendly function map. So this right here is a pure function that takes an input, it rotates it out, and then gives it back. So if we map this across the fluxes, it'll take each name in this flux, rotate it, and then spit it back, and then go to the next one. And so now we actually have a list of all of the fluxes rotated. We can put that in here for the table heading. And here is a fancier version of the stoichiometric matrix. Now table form doesn't have very many options past what I've showed you. So say that we want to have these dashed lines or thick lines, we need to use the grid function. So grid works very similarly. It arranges things into a grid. Except the difference is that grid does not have the table headings option, and some of the other options are slightly changed. So instead of table alignments, we use just alignment. And instead of table spacing, we use item size goes to full. Now, in order to get the headings where we want them, we actually need to go back into this list form of the glycolysis matrix and actually add, physically add a list of all the headings up on top and on the side. So if we want to add the flux labels, we take our headings that we used up here for the flux We prepend these labels to the glycolysis matrix. Wrong way. We have to, for prepend, takes the expression or the list 
with the element afterwards. So this will add this list of fluxes before this matrix. So if we actually take this and put it in a grid, looks much better. In order to add the row headings, we actually need to take this item here, transpose it so that we can add the row headings on top and then transpose it back. So when we transpose this, we get a 90 degree tilted matrix. So if we look back here, we see the first row is the first column, VHK. Second row is the second column, VPGI. So the first column that we actually want is this label of all the flux or all the metabolites. So we want to once again prepend glycolysis fluxes. Or sorry, species. And this will put the list of the species before this list of the first reaction. Now what we can do is transpose it back so that everything's back to the normal way. But when we do this, we're going to see an error. And so it says the first two levels cannot be transposed. And that's because there's actually 20 metabolites here, and there's 20 um, rows in the stoichiometric matrix, but we added an extra row. So we're going to have to add an extra blank space right before the first metabolite up here in our glycolysis species. So we're going to once again prepend, we'll just prepend a blank space. And now it works out. And so if we turn this into the grid, we can see that we have very similar to what we had up here. Except the difference is now we can put in thick dividers, thin dividers, change all sorts of things, including the background colors. Um, there's tons of different options in, with grid. You can look more into that if you go to the grid documentation page. So I'll leave that there for now. And finally, we're going to talk about a couple of the mass toolbox functions. So the get element elemental matrix function will give you the elemental matrix for a module. It gives first the elements in the module and then the elemental matrix. If you just want to take a quick look at it, you can use the table form and set it to true. And that gives a nice layout where you can see it easily. However, if you do want to use that elemental matrix, for example, um, for quality control, then you use get elemental matrix to, oops, of glycolysis and the second element to actually just get out the elemental matrix itself. So that way you can see when we dot this against the stoichiometric matrix, most of these reactions are elementally balanced. The only ones that are not would be any exchange reactions. And finally, we're going to talk about the min span function. When we run the min span on a module, it uses some parallel computing, which is why it shows all of that stuff, but then it finally gives out vectors of fluxes. If we want to put this into a table form so that we can get it in here, what we do is we use the paths to pathway matrix min span glycolysis. And we have to put glycolysis in there twice. Whoops. Glycolysis goes first. And now we have it in a format that can go easily in here. And so that is all the required information you need in order to create any of the tables in this textbook. The next tutorial will actually go over the actual creation of this table.